Welcome to the Traveler's Blueprint. Start designing your next adventure. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on the Traveler's Blueprint Travel A Roundtable Discussion, where we aim to discuss the beautiful, di beautiful diversity of our planet as it relates to culture, gender, race, the environment, and of course, travel logistics. If this is your first time tuning in, welcome to the show. If you're a regular listener, thank you. Before we get into the show today, if you're listening to this and you are yourself an expert in the travel industry in some way and are interested in joining a future discussion, please submit your information through our website at or, or through the email at thetravelersblueprint at gmail.com with your name, website information, and what you do. Uh, if you have a few topics you'd be interested in discussing, send those as well, and we'll get you on for a future Travel Around Table episode. Before we jump into the conversation today, I want to take a minute to introduce uh, our panel members. Um, I'm going to ask you where you're located, how you're involved in the travel community, and where people can find you online to just check up on your content. So let's get started. Brandon, uh, why don't you take it? All right. I'm uh, Brandon Shaw, currently located in Florida at the moment, but we offer tours throughout Europe for the most part specializing in Italy, France, and Barcelona, and London now, uh, when everything gets back to normal. You can find us on theromanguide.com or thetourguide.com. And, uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, and and we've had a conversation previously on the podcast, and if, if you're interested in learning all about Rome, definitely check that out. Igor, what about you? Oh, guys, my name is Igor, or Igor, as the little helper of Frankenstein. I'm based in Venice, Italy, and uh, my website is www.tourleadervenice.com. I mainly do tour in Venice itself uh, with gondola rides, tours of the lagoon, wine tasting, and exploring Venice off the beaten path. Yeah, and we you were on the podcast as well. All three of you were really, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we and we had a great discussion on on Venice and some behind the scenes looks at that. Keshler, you are now a, you've been on a few times now. Why don't you give the, the, the audience some insight on where you're from and what you do? Well, hello, listeners. Uh, my name is Keshler Tibet. I'm with Lake Art Tourism. Uh, I have a few uh, duties. One, I am a tour guide in the Philadelphia area covering history, like the basics or introduction to America, as well as some places in Philly that most people don't typically get to see, like Germany, Germantown, Manion, places like that as well as I am a travel director as with uh, Lake and Art Tourism, like I said before. Uh, venture, culture, luxury, with a big focus on culture, actually trying to learn and get to appreciate the various cultures instead of just going there to just be a tourist. You're actually taking part in what's happening around you. And once again, I'm happy to be back on. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And... So let's jump into the topic. If you are down, if you downloaded this, you already know it's we're going to talk about the future of travel very quickly. I want to define what that means. And for the basis of this conversation, the future of travel is going to be what to expect for travel within the next two to five years. I guess from this point on and up to five years, because we think I, I, there, there's a lot there's a lot to break down. We really don't know what to expect in some regard. So Keshler, I. I Think I want you to get started with this because I know you recently toured portions of the United States for your own research to kind of get an idea of how different states are handling the coronavirus, the movement being involved in different states. And you're also paying very close attention to what's going on in countries around the world. You're actively providing us with information on what's happening in the ground in, in South American countries and throughout Europe. So from the research you've put in thus far, from the travels you've you've experienced over the past few months, what is your insight? What are you expecting with travel for the future? Everyone be flexible. <laughs> That's what I'm seeing so far. Uh, right now, the trend is no one books anything more than two weeks out because you can't tell what's going to happen beyond that point. So if I see something that's like a month away, I was like, oh, you're really taking that risk. Uh, as a lot of number of you know, especially if you're in the United States, the rules and regulations change almost weekly. So it's really like, be flexible, like plan last minute. But the biggest thing that's happening now, and I keep saying United States, the biggest thing happening here as far as travel is national parks. But I see a restlessness. Uh, they want to go other places. They want to travel to Mexico. They've probably already been to Mexico. Now they want more. 
anything beyond that, like I said, I was like, I don't know what's going to happen in the next two to five years because it's still, it's so uncertain. Uh, other countries are like other tour guides and other people I know in other countries are talking to me and telling me like, Hey, you know, we're going to be opening up soon, but they're very apprehensive because for them as well, they don't know what's going to happen next. So your question, what's going to happen in two to five years, adjustment period, <laughs> well, trying to figure out how to proceed, how to move from this period that we're in right now. It's all just a lot of like question marks. Now, do, does anybody here think that travel is going to pick up significantly within the next year let's let's scale it back maybe five years is too far ahead to think about how about 2021 I, that's still unknown in a lot of regard brandon do you have any any insight or, or any optimism towards what you think travel will look like over the next year i'm super optimistic again i was telling elliot before i think it really depends on the vaccine i think that's really what everybody in the travel industry is waiting for once we have an actual it's two steps once you have the vaccine and then how quick you can actually distribute it. But we have in our we have a, a custom trip planning service and we have a lot of customers who had to cancel their trips this year and they're rebooking everything for next year. I even have a biochemist that works in a hospital in New York City and, and she's like, you know, by next year, it should be fine. I think that's so, interesting because we do, right? We in our conversation before that we actually started talking on the podcast, the the vaccine seems imminent. It seems like it could be here within the next three months. Distribution a little bit longer after that. But beyond the vaccine, we also have the the plasma, which is basically someone healthy that was able to fight off the virus and then taking that plasma and giving it to other people and basically cloning it is another form. It's not a vaccine, but it will help fight. So we have two two options in the near future. I think yeah. it's going to I think it's going to take off. I think people, you know, like you said, it's people are restless. People want to go. People don't want to stay in the United States. So a lot of our customers like we're coming back next year. If they allow us to get on a plane, which obviously is, is a big if, if they allow us to go, we're going to go. And even if you don't take the, a lot of people are against the vaccine. If you're against the vaccine, that's fine. But at least there's something out there, you know, that yeah. you can take if, if you want. Yep. People. So it should help alleviate some of the panic, I think. My my worry is, let's say a vaccine comes out in January, I, and I think that's still optimistic. being optimistic for for a quick turn on this vaccine. It's still going to take what another year or two before it reaches a majority of the population to the point that we can then travel safely. So I worry that even with a vaccine, when will travel go back to being normal? Elliot, do you have something to counter? Well, with? yeah, because so. There's a lot of research on how the vaccine would best be distributed, right? You're not going to give vaccines to people that haven't been exposed to it. You're going to give vaccines to the people that are most likely to get the virus, which includes family and friends of someone that already had the virus. So you're going to give them the vaccine and you're essentially doing what firefighters do. They try to get rid of the fuel in areas that the fire is growing. So if you block the virus from transmitting to various people, you have a better chance at squelching it with fewer vaccinations. So you don't need to vaccine the entire population. You only need to vaccinate people in close proximity to people that had the virus. Okay. Now, Igor, you are located in Venice, one of the biggest travel destinations on the planet. Are you noticing a shift in in the hotel operators and the uh, landmark operators, the museum operators that are shifting to maybe a limited experience or just sort of changing the direction of how they operate so they can accommodate people in this post-pandemic world. So what is happening right now? And so talking about plasma, uh, we are tasting plasma ideas starting from last May. It seems that it might be an option, actually, besides the vaccine. And talk about uh, from tourists in Venice. Uh, yeah, uh, um, we got something like 30 million visitors every year. Uh, what I'm starting to see with the people that they are rebooking for 2021, they're like, okay, we're coming back, but we don't want to have big crowds. We don't want to face St. Mark's Square full of 200,000 people, actually. 
what they are mainly asking is, uh, look, we come to Venice, but take me to off the beaten path. And so as less people that I'm going to see, I will be way much happier, actually. And uh, what is happening right now is uh, that the um, Basilica, the St. Mark Basilica at the moment is closed. And so you are not allowed to go in and you got restrictions on the entrances of the Doji's Palace. And so what is happening right now is a few restrictions here and there. Some churches, they are still closed uh, and they're trying to see how the evolution of the things uh, is going on. Mainly at the moment, uh, what is happening here is that we got Germans, Austrians and Swiss. And starting from this week, we won't have Swiss guests in Venice because uh, the new law is saying that once that they go back to Switzerland, they are going to go into a quarantine. Or you as an Italian, once that you go back from Switzerland, you go back to Italy, you are going to have the quarantine. Mm -hmm. And so that's the evolution of the situation. Now, that with that information, with people asking to do more off the beaten path locations, are not any of you could take this. Are you trying to revamp your your niche to focus on instead of Rome, you focus on the outskirts of Rome, which I'm sure there's still a lot to do, especially for foreigners to see and experience. Are you trying to figure out ways to pull people out of these densely populated locations that are historically hotspots for tourism and saying here, this is what else you can see in the countryside. And it's still a great experience in its own are you, are you guys, any of you doing that or trying to revamp or remodel your tourism? It's hard for Rome. I mean, because Rome is Rome. So, you know, if you're going to come to Rome, you're going to want to see the Vatican and the Colosseum. <laughs> so right. I can say, hey, listen, we can go to a little town outside. But they're like, yeah, but the Colosseum is, <laughs> is in the yeah. middle of, of the town. But what they are doing, you know, the same thing as what Igor said, they're restricting the amount of people that can come inside. You can't just buy tickets on your own and just jump into the Vatican right now. They're doing time slotted entrances. Coliseum also minimizing the amount of people that can come inside. So if they continue with that, that within itself, our group sizes are, we're making them much smaller, you know, max 10 people that can go in, you know, as before you could go up to 24 even. So I think some measures are being put in, in that way to make sure to reduce the amount of people and the, the amount of people that could contaminate other people, I guess. And the Brandon, same thing in Philadelphia. Uh, also got it, yeah. Sorry guys. Brandon, did you see the last news about the Vatican? About the weekends, did you hear anything? No. What's the what's okay. the latest? The latest, the latest uh, is going to be pretty crazy. <laughs> the Vatican City, they don't want to have private tours in the Vatican during the weekends. Well, it's closed on Sundays anyway, so I guess yeah, Saturdays yeah, no, they want Okay, wanna... but now they want to close, close. <laughs> they don't want to see groups, private people with private guides, and that is going to be mm, interesting. <laughs> Perfect. So I now know. they're limiting, not only the weekly tours will be limited, now they're completely removing an entire day. I, I have to wonder, you know, a big problem with places like the Vatican was everybody would complain about how crowded it is. You know, the, you didn't really get a, I don't want to call it, you didn't get a great experience because you still could, but you couldn't ignore the amount of people that were there sharing that space with you. And I'm wondering now, because we're being forced to limit the amount of people going to these experiences, will people then want to go back to being shoulder to shoulder or will there be this new uh, design for tours where people are, want to limit the space it also preserves these structures too right i don't know it's, it seems like it's going to be an odd balance there's going to be fight back because obviously you got you know you you you, you want to make money too i i don't know it's have any of you thought of that i think the memory is short i think within a year if everything goes back to normal again i i think it's it'll get back to the vatican as well are going to start counting oh well we can make a lot more money you know yeah. if we Open things that, back up again. So. Is that really it for everything? Is like the loss of revenue, especially these days, will make them say, "Well, you know what? Let's let's go back to the way it was before." Yeah. Right. I I don't think people are going to have much of an issue. I've, there's only a few people that I've talked to that are actually happy with some of the changes, like giving hugs or handshakes anymore. Isn't something that be, that they want to stick. They just don't care for them. But I think for the majority of people, right, it's human nature. Like we want contact. We want to be close to other people. 
and we want to not necessarily be crammed in like sardines but we don't mind crowds for the most part as long as we still get to do what we want to I mean, they're doing there's the a same vaccine thing. right if yeah, there's a vaccine. Actual vaccine yeah i mean they're doing the same thing here in philadelphia where they're limiting how many people go into the structure for the liberty bell but i think it's about 11 people at a time 11 people go in boom 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 you see take photos and then you're out but now the lines have developed where it kind of wraps around the corner and looking at it, it's like they're still kind of getting close to each other. They're still so it's like, okay, you're limiting it, but people are all come together outside now. So Yeah, slightly better because it's outside, but still yeah. cramped. Yeah. Yeah. It's I, I I I don't know. Part of me thinks that limiting the, the amount of people inside would catch on. But I guess I guess not. I guess not. You know. Because everyone's doing the same thing. Everyone wants to get out. Everyone wants to explore. So everyone's thinking like, yeah, I went off the beaten path. But then everyone's going off of the beaten path at that same mentality. So everyone's off the beaten path. And now they're huddled together there. So <laughs> it's like damned if you do, damned if you don't. I guess yeah. the good thing, though, is that there won't be, although there's a lull, we all can agree that based on what we understand about the, the travel, it, it's going to bounce back dramatically. Like the people who want to travel and were unable to travel still want to travel. And they're just sort of, uh, to quote somebody, standing by and waiting to to travel as soon as they can. Um, right? So it's going to bounce back. It's just a matter of time. We're just all waiting patiently for travel to get back to where it was. And it's inevitable that it will bounce back to where it, it used to be. Does anybody here think that it's not going to be the same industry that it was pre-COVID. No, I, no I'm, I, I'm positive. I'm positive. Yeah, I think in the beginning of the pandemic, when there was when there was a lot of questions on what the virus actually was, and the there was questions of if a vaccine was possible. That's when I started to question if anything was going to be back to normal. But now that a vaccine is promising and the plasma has been promising. I think we're going to return to probably the same normalcy that we saw in 2019. Do you think the pandemic has pushed any long-standing changes or or policy changes to the travel industry? Are we going to do things differently now because we know what could happen to the travel industry? Will there be precautions made, um, whether it's with the airline industry or tour companies or anything like that, that that are going to be in place because of the pandemic. I I hope we see not just company policy but global policy, right? This is the first time in the in the history of humanity that every single individual, every single country has been fighting the same cause. And it's all been tangible. I mean, right? We should all be fighting climate change, but there's some non-believers out there and therefore we're not fighting it. But to have a the International Monetary Fund actually provide resources and a rainy day fund for a global pandemic in the future. It's been talked about, but it's never been taken into action. And now I think we have proof that it is needed. Yeah. I mean, I, I can only hope I can only hope so. I again I think people have a short memory and I think this is gonna bounce back quickly. And a year from now. Hopefully, you know, people are going to be shoulder to shoulder in the Vatican or in St. Mark's and it's going to be this, just like it was before. Yeah, I'm it's hopeful awesome. that it's a short term memory in that sense, but I'm hopeful it's a long term memory in the sense that we don't ever want it to happen again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But now, the are going to stick around for a little bit, but like you're saying, it's everyone's just going to go back because people do want to get closer to each other. It's like you, you can try to keep us apart, but eventually we're going to want to get close to each other. We want to interact with people. It was strange for me to visit another state and there's a partition right there and I just can't have a conversation. We're looking at it, you're like, hey, if it wasn't for the glass, we can, you know, we'd really be able to talk, but we can't. But once that goes away, it's going to be like, all right, let me move my chair a little bit closer. Hey, how's it going? Hey, hey, hey. Yep. Yeah. And so, all right. So I, it seems like we're all in agreement that we don't know when it will go back to normal. We're waiting on the vaccine. Essentially, we're all at the mercy of this vaccine rolling out. But once it does, we all think that travel will get back to normal. Uh at relatively quickly. So in the meantime, though, what are some of the things that you guys are doing to entice travelers to continue to travel? I know, Keshler, you and I speak quite often, and you do have tra you do have people rolling into Philadelphia asking for tours. And so there still 
is there still are people out there who are trying to travel during this. Um, Brandon or Igor, what are your experiences with operating in Italy? And obviously Americans were shunned this past summer, but um, (laughs) uh, what are you guys doing to still have people, you know, book tours and and provide those those experiences for for your guests asking for spare change in the street spare change (laughs) (laughs) Uh. we're almost there (laughs) almost getting closer (laughs) well but but uh igor were you doing tours did you do tours this this past summer and so I done a bunch of tours uh, with germans austrians uh, and the swiss and a few Italians, actually. And then uh, I'm trying to do a bunch of crazy things. And so basically, I'm trying to involve what uh, guys that they love the bicycle. I just finished the last mission that we've done a gondola ride with a bicycle inside of the gondola, plus a pub crawling in the Venetian Canal. <laughs> so bike riding, bike riding, gondola bike riding, ride. and then drinking. <laughs> Sounds Absolutely awesome. right. At that <laughs> point, actually, nobody can stop you. Nobody can tell you boo, you have to do the alcohol test. We got the gondolier that is rowing. You can drink as much as you can, and then <laughs> life jacket on. <laughs> now, now, how is how is Venice um, as a city adjusted to the significant decrease in tourists? It's. I know. I saw a bunch of videos of like you know fish populations coming back and dolphins swimming through the canal. So is there any, is there going to be any push for Venice to hold on to this in some way? Because I know pre, pre-COVID, they were trying to make a push to stop cruise ships from coming to the, to the city. to dock Yeah, you're right, city. Bob. And that's what we were saying last time that we were having the chat. Uh, and everybody was protesting, no cruise ship, no cruise ship. Now we got a new protest that is, yes, cruise ship, yes, cruise yeah, ship. Please, cruise back. ship, please, please cruise ship. <laughs> <laughs> that they figured out that the 80,000 euros to dock a boat, to dock a ship in Venice per day is quite good. Uh, the entire idea is uh, that we're having more moonfish, pretty big, massive in the Venetian Lagoon. We got more seahorses, starfish, uh, jellyfish, and we never had as many as this year. And we are having more uh, flamingos in the um, Venetian Lagoon. And uh, I believe that we're having quite a lot. What I'm trying to do right now is, I know that it sounds quite crazy, but all the Italians are crazy. And so with uh, a friend of mine, Gondolier, we are building up a boat to go to collect rubbish in the Venetian Lagoon and bring the people collecting rubbish and help the environment and all these things. So the idea is, private boat nobody will bother you you will be totally your party and you help uh, uh, mother nature and so on and you keep going with that idea there's already the buzzwords around that ecotourism volunteerism yeah that's yeah 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 there's a lot of people that are in that are that are into doing that stuff yeah i think for right. us we um you know in the end we had a lot of tourists not so, we do mostly english language so we had a few germans who were doing tours in english um, not like, you know, with Igor, but we had a lot of British people, a lot of British tourists that came into Rome and were doing tours with us like that, as far as physical tours. But, you know, like I said before, we were limiting the amount of people in the tours and sometimes doing groups of two or six, you know, two, four, six people. What we found has been really good is our virtual tours. Okay. We've run, a, we've been running a lot of virtual tours since March and people have really picked up on it. You know, as Americans for the most part, obviously, because they can't get over to Europe. And so we have our, our tour guys would normally do a regular tour and instead they're doing these virtual tours. And it's been a, a, a big success. People really like it. And we just keep adding new and new sites. And yeah. say, thank you. We can't travel, but at least we can do this. You know, at least we so, can see it virtually. Uh, what are the virtual tours? Are they live? Are they pre recorded? So it's not pre recorded. It's kind of like almost a webinar where you have the, the tour guide is live and they we have a live chat function. And so they can just speak with the actual people who are watching it and they'll go over various slides and explain, you know, do a tour of the Vatican museums uh, in a virtual sense of just photos and explaining it and giving a lot of anecdotes. So okay. we try and focus a lot more. It's not like a history lesson, but on fun stories of what you would see when you get to actually go to the Vatican. 
Okay. And then moving forward, we're going to actually try and experiment with a real live guide walking down the street by the Coliseum. Uh, we're logistically, we're trying to figure that out, how that's going to work. But that, that seems like a great idea. Two. Yeah, even after the pandemic, to be able to provide people who might not be able to afford a trip to Italy to still do it virtually. Yeah, that, that seems like a great idea. I We, we talked about the tour, the, your virtual tours back, you know, way back when, um, yeah. when we were figuring it all out, uh, when, when COVID first hit. Um, and, and so the, the thing that I, that I really like about them is for people who are into history already, instead of just watching the history channel, they get to sit down and, and, you know, instead of watching a special on the Vatican, you can now right talk to somebody about the Vatican, have a live chat option going on. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a great, great idea. And I, I could definitely see that helping you throughout the, the pandemic and, and once it's done as well. But and, that's pretty much what I'm doing too, actually in Venice. And so for me, the virtual tour is working like this. Uh, I give you an invitation via Skype or Zoom or whatever. At, le at that time you get connected Normally, I start on the top of the Rialto Bridge or the fish market or whatever, and then I walk them to St. Mark's Square. At that point, they got the chances to ask as many questions as possible, actually. that Once that they come back, they can have a normal tour, be more confident with the city. They can understand a little bit better the entire city or the spot where they are. Yeah. Now, has, has COVID-19 provided you with any insight on the travel world, the travel industry? Has it made you realize something that you didn't realize before? Anybody? I, I just see how fragile the whole yeah. economy <laughs> actually is. I think that's the main thing where you go from Monday in, you know, in February, you're like everything's going great. We're going to have a record year. It's awesome. To Friday being like, Oh, it's that serious. It's that, yeah. it's that fast. It happened that fast. It was incredible how quickly it crashed. I think as soon as people saw what was happening on cruise ships and mm -hmm. when the pandemic, the, the virus was still, there were a lot of unknowns about how deadly it was and how quickly it could spread. It, it was incredible to see essentially the world come to a halt like it did and airlines just become grounded and empty and cruise ships just become empty too. I, it, 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 it's mind boggling that that happened. I mean, still, it, it, there's still not a lot going on, but we, we lived through a time in history where every sporting event, every musical event, every restaurant bar, it, it was just all closed almost overnight. It, it's just, it's still, it still boggles yeah. my mind that we were able to put a, this, this, because we're all in this global especially with travel, we're kind of like one organism where the airlines are all relying on people across the world. And it just, I don't know, came, came to a standstill. It is very fragile. And you don't realize that such a large industry is so fragile. Yeah. We didn't um, have anything I, to compare it to. Has anybody thought of or? No. But uh, yeah, no. And, and has anybody thought of or heard of any precautions we could take for the next one? Because are we in a better position than we were before coronavirus for the next pandemic because it's inevitable right these things just jump from animals and they're going to happen again i'm sure oh yeah i think we're definitely in a better Are position we doing anything? is there anything in place to I think stop governments it from might react again? a little bit faster moving forward yeah uh, some think think yeah more yeah. experience yeah yeah we definitely have experience yeah. now we know we know generally how it would traverse the planet and we have better, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily related to travel, but it just in general practices of how to, you know, socially distance on how to wear a face mask on things that you should do and things that you shouldn't do. Um, but it, we talked about things that we would, that we think will happen to the travel industry long term impact wise. And I think personal mobility is going to be a big one. And Bob, we've had a conversation with someone about autonomous vehicles, but I think personalized, basically Uber air taxis are going to become a thing. They've already established it. There are a lot of startup companies that have these air taxis that are basically motorcycles. They look like motorcycles, but with propellers. <laughs> and so they will take you from building to building. 
typically intercity or intracity. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Aren't they doing that in Dubai? I mean, didn't they launch that a few months ago? Or? I wouldn't put it past them. Yeah, I feel like Dubai would be the first place to to have that technology roll out. Yeah. But we also talked about, uh, we since we do our Travel Bite episodes at the beginning of every month, just last month, uh, airline industries are still doing their research and development to try to make travel, A, more sustainable, but also more cost effective. So Boeing is looking at hydrogen fuel cells. And it yeah. could reduce the cost per seat by up to 50 or 60%. And that's not just passing the profits down to the consumer, but also that makes it easier for them to have more flights, have more planes. So, I mean, I think overall, yeah. I think it, it could be a really positive thing moving mm-hmm. forward. If, if anything, like I said, I was talking about the virtual tours before. I think between virtual tours for people coming to us and saying, hey, listen, I have, I have some kind of... Uh, physical problem, I can't travel, you know, at least now the world of virtual tours is opening up much more, I think, than it was before. So this is something that a lot of tour companies, I think, might actually retain moving forward. Or it could be like, hey, you're coming to Italy next year. Why don't you do a virtual tour first to get an idea, get excited about what you're doing, and then go do the actual tour. Yeah. Um, I think it's, besides that, as far as like companies working, having everybody work remotely moving forward. I mean, you see all the big tech companies, a lot of people now are moving more towards not working in a, in a virtual, in, more in a, uh, not in a set office. Yeah. So that might have a huge effect moving forward. Uh, yeah. yeah. It, I think that's a really, I think that it's something that people haven't really thought about, but I think that could have a massive impact on local tourism, right? Because if people, if half the population isn't traveling into Philadelphia to go to work, half the people aren't also going out to lunch or getting coffee or going out to dinner. And that's just part of their weekly routine. And now that's not happening at all. Yeah. That, that would be smart for uh, someone like Airbnb to push the digital nomad tourism sector. Cause I, I already have friends who are now realizing they can work from home. My a friend of mine and his fiance both have remote jobs and so now they're looking to travel to Italy, I'm sorry, to uh, Hawaii for six weeks, come back to California, rent a car, and then just spend another few months seeing the entire United States and working the entire time. And so there is going to be this new industry. There's how many millions of people now realize that they can work, they can do their job from Rome, from Venice, from Lima, and yeah. That, that opens up the doors for a lot of people who really didn't travel before because they were confined by work, by their 40-hour work week, who now realize they can do that 40-hour work week anywhere and then in the evenings get dinner in Rome and and do things like that. So there's that. There's a whole new sector that's emerging, really, right? Yeah. That's, that's really it's interesting. It's really exciting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know huh. you're right. Uh, think about all the people that they moved to Bali or Buddha that they are working uh, directly from those platforms uh, right there. Going back to the idea of the airplanes, Scandinavia Airlines, uh, right now they are having problems uh, with clients. Why? Because uh, Scandinavia actually, they are much aware of all the problems of the pollution that an airplane is causing. And so a lot of the Scandinavians, they are not catching flights, uh, otherwise they are going to cause too much pollution. And so at this moment, Scandinavia Airlines is the only company all over the world that is doing researches about electric airplanes. And that yeah. is going to affect the market. <laughs> yeah, I think electric airplanes and hydrogen fuel cell planes are going to, I think it's only a matter of time until they are, just like with cars, they are the only form of aviation, I think. Fossil fuels and jet fuel in particular with its high cost, high explosivity and reliance on other countries to produce it. I think it's going to fade out. It may be 30 or 40 years, though. I think that's inevitable for the travel community because you have this people who travel tend to be more environmentally conscious, but like enjoy doing something that has a huge impact on the environment. So there, there has to be a solution made eventually. There has to be something that comes we, together. We can't people... all be Greta Thunberg who, you know, sailed across the Atlantic. <laughs> right. We're, we're at the mercy of the technology that's available to us. But I think as more travelers push for that, the industry will, also, will, will accommodate them. That's Igor, what do, what do you think about the electric boats in, uh, in Venice? 
Uh, we the, the motor boats. Do you guys have have you seen any electric boats? And so we inaugurated the first one actually, which is a motor boat with something like uh, almost 100 seats. They are producing the engine something like 20 minutes out of Venice. At the moment, it's working pretty good actually, and uh, it seems uh, that right now you are getting uh, subsidization from the European Community if you are going to turn your boat into an electric one. And so I see that we're going to go in the same directions as Amsterdam, that all the boats that they do the canal tours, the majority, they're getting electric one. I believe that we're going to go in that direction, actually. Or at wow. least I hope. Yeah, that's awesome. That is awesome. Well, I think that's what's a little different between the US and Europe is that for the most part, Europe runs on 220 volt and the US is 110. So the infrastructure in Europe is a lot. It's twice as powerful so it can charge like for most cars in the united states if you charge on a 110 volt outlet it takes days to charge a 100 kilowatt hour battery which is not very feasible for anyone so you have to get a special charger and upgrade your breaker and all this other stuff in order to make it feasible so that is you know one step ahead for europe yeah but right now we've got tesla recharger pretty much everywhere actually that in something like 30 minutes, 45 yeah. minutes, you are going to have almost half of the amp battery full. And so that is going to be awesome, actually. And it's working perfectly. I can really see the increase of people that are buying Tesla year after year or month after month. We're having mm -hmm. more and more and more and more. Not in Venice Island, but in the outskirts, of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think it's one of the... It, it's one of the... Teslas are the top, I think, in the top three of most sold electric cars in Europe right now. And Europe actually has quite a few other electric models compared to the United States. Hey, if it's I, not I a Tesla, it's an Audi. Is... <laughs> an Audi, yeah. yeah I, I know Switzerland is pushing this new eco-electric tour across their entire nation where you can essentially rent an electric car. Tesla, they're, they're pushing Teslas. And they already map out the entire itinerary for you, which towns to visit, where all of the charging stations are. And they're enticing people, come to our country, drive across the entire country. It's a very small country for those who might not be familiar with it. But um, <laughs> you can see the entire country very easily. And they, they tell you which towns to visit and what why you should visit those towns, whether it's chocolate or watches or whatever it is. And it's a really cool idea because, yeah, mm -hmm. I think like we just mentioned, environmental uh, or eco-consciousness uh, Ecotourism is very, it, it's, it's we, on the rise. We were so, one of the I, first I, ones to do golf cart tours in Rome. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was like four years ago. And we had the big seven-seater. And we are going around the city. Of course, you know, Rome, Romans are very particular people. If you haven't been there, I'm sure Igor has a, a few opinions about them. But it's a very, very, very specific people in many aspects. Uh, almost all positive. You know, I'm definitely in, in a positive way. I love Roman. But you the, can the say whatever drive... you want, Brandon. You will, you <laughs> yeah, will, I will never get offended. You can say <laughs> yeah. whatever you want. We, we're sure. just going to have this, a laugh. That's it. This so is don't being worry. Recorded, <laughs> <laughs> this is... You are guilty. I this sue is... you. <laughs> uh, I, I this is that. on the record. <laughs> but the problem is that the taxi drivers and everybody started, they didn't understand what we were doing. And they thought we were acting like a taxi service. And so, you know, they kind of shut us down. Now we're talking with the government again to try and get it moving and explain exactly what it is we want to do. Because, you know, Rome is, is a very condensed, packed city, uh, you know, very similar to Venice, you know, in that area. So we're trying to really go now and, and find new ways to do more green tourism, which people, especially in America, they really enjoy and like. So hopefully for next year, we can get that started again. And uh, but that's what I'm trying to ask to the local city hall, actually, because I would like to do let's say tesla tour electric tour with the prosecco wine region actually but the point is if you don't have a nhg a rent a car with driver actually if you don't have the license right. in the tesla you cannot run a tour and so let's see how we're going to deal with that actually i cannot buy 200 tesla to do the tours actually otherwise <laughs> yeah. it's gonna be a big Re regulation investment. regulation is yeah. pretty strict but i think it's something new also for the government right they don't really know how to deal with it yet so that it's kind of a gray area but hopefully we can stay strong you know 20 2021 2022 have all electric car fleets everywhere oh, that'd awesome. be so awesome i hope 2021 i brandon i told this to igor i re i rebooked my my italy trip for may and now I don't know. I'm back and forth on whether or not. I I think by May you'll be we'll good. See. 
I'm up. I think you. I, I hope I'm so. Optim- I'm optimistic. I, I, I think it's going to be good. I think they're going to once the vaccine, they open the borders, and then it's good to go. Yeah, maybe by May yeah. it'll be like right on the edge where nobody or very few people will be traveling, but it'll be okay to travel, and you'll have Italy to yourself. Oh, see, I'm think I I'm expecting Italy. I'm, I'm I just to be overran with tourists because every one it's the most pop one of the most popular places to go. And how many people had their plans canceled? I, I'm in my head. I'm like I need to book immediately. The second I think it's going to happen, I'm booking everything because I'm worried that the demand is going to be so high. I don't. And so if you're listening to this and you're trying to figure out when to book travel, you need to keep that in mind because I think Italy and Paris and these cities that Americans did not get to visit. Uh, the past, this past summer, all those people who had travel plans are now going to book. The people who didn't have travel plans but now are really want to get out because they've been stuck inside are going to book. Mm-hmm. And so, the the floodgates. As soon as we're able to, I, you know, as soon as that vaccine's available, the floodgates are going to open. And I still think people are still going to be scared. You're, yeah. All of you are much more optimistic. Some people, I, I still yeah. think it's going to be another year before people are going to feel comfortable traveling. And so, it, I back in my head, I see twenty twenty three. Really, really, yeah. yeah. But even for even for, I think maybe there are older generate older generations that might not go. I mean, right that's away. a quarter of America. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and they're the ones that are going to most typically travel to Europe because it's the easiest to travel to, right? Yeah, shorter distance. Yeah, the infrastructure is easier for them, but. It, I don't know. I, I think uh, my age group and younger, the second you're available, it's available. People are going to book. Or the I hardcore can't... travelers, people who travel, you know, who make it their lifestyle. I think they're definitely going to go back. Yeah. You might have more of the conservative, this conservative group of people who are going to travel less. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Because we stay optimistic for now. Yeah. And when we talked in the beginning, like COVID 19 won't be eradicated ever. We just don't have that possibility. It becomes like the flu, right? And yeah. Flu, so that's why I'm telling people something we're just going to have to adapt to. It's just going to be a part of our lives. Just don't let it completely unrail your life, derail your life. It's going to yeah. be here. Yeah, it's just a new risk yeah. that we have to be, we have to learn how to mitigate and what we can't mitigate, accept. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, but I tell you this one that is quite funny. Uh, sorry for the American friend that, that uh, it might be probably too funny for you. Look, my grandmother was born in 1901. And so basically she survived two wars. At the beginning of the first war, 1915, 1918, what happened? All the little girls at that time, she was 14. She has been forced by the government to smoke. To smoke that was cigar. a thing? Yeah, that's what the thing. That's what that was the cure for the Spanish flu, for the Spanish disease. And so, starting from 1915, pretty much until 1997, when she died, she was smoking one Cuban cigar and a half a day. She had seven kids. <laughs> she ended up to hospital once. She sent to hell the nun. She went back home and she died home, and she was perfect until the last day. My grandfather was the same. He was forced to smoke when he was little. And so he wasn't even 16 years old. He was smoking the pipe. And that was the solution for the Spanish flu here in Italy. That's awesome. We need, we need wow. to distribute Cuban cigars across the population. There. Bob, don't say that. Otherwise, we're going to be guilty. No way. No, we That's... cannot force anybody to smoke. No, otherwise, it's going to be a problem. But in Italy, that's what happened 100 years ago. Wow. I never knew that. I that's love awesome. I, That's, that's why stuff. I love this. <laughs> you learned that's some really interesting. Really, like say, really fun facts. That kind uh, of people that they were born at the beginning of the 1900 they were all heavy smokers actually yeah. <laughs> and none of them yeah. die with uh, cancer or lung diseases or these kind of things they were built to yeah. last <laughs> you know why you know why it's the diet that's what i'm gonna fall back we don't need to go on that tangent but the their vino, diet the vino, was the much vino. more natural they <laughs> weren't eating uh the crap that we all eat today it was very natural and uh easy for them to digest and i think it helped them live longer 
But Bob, it was easy to digest because they were splitting and docking 25 people. They were, they were what? <laughs> they were splitting a duck, a rooster, whatever, uh, 25 persons. Yeah. And so they were not eating much. Yeah. <laughs> That's just, just pr Prosecco, a lot of Prosecco. Yes. Yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If it I wasn't am... Prosecco, it was the grappa. <laughs> yeah. By the way, Igor, I am extremely excited to go on that Tesla tour through the Prosecco region. I cannot wait to do that. That sounds amazing. That, that one is pretty cool, actually, especially because uh, it's going to be fun for sure. <laughs> yeah, that'll be fun. <laughs> All right. Elliot, are you ready for uh, your last question? Do you see it on there? <laughs> yes. All right. So, uh, Igor, let's start with you. And then we'll move to Keschler and then Brandon. What advice can you give our listeners who are typically travel enthusiasts on how to plan and proceed with travel? Interesting question, but it's really difficult to answer actually. Since that we are changing all the procedure, all the laws week after week, day by day, actually it's really difficult to book well in advance since that you are not sure that a flight is gonna be there for you or whatever else. As Bob said before, when they open the gates, the cages, I believe that everybody's going to run fast to book a flight, a hotel, or whatever else, actually. And so probably booking ahead of time, whatever you are able to book it, book it now because you're going to have amazing deals. Something that you're not going to find after that they are going to open the cages. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Catch yeah. that. Yeah, same thought. It's hard to answer that question. It's, it's not like I'm repeating what Igor just said. It's just when be flexible uh, to book. And I've been telling people this for a while. Book the flight now, but be ready to possibly like, get a voucher or change it at a later date in case you can't travel then. And just like be aware of what's going on in that country or destination that you're trying to go to. Because like everything else, it's just changing so often that you may find that the rules that you originally thought were in place when you booked it and were ready to go have changed dramatically when you get closer to your travel day. So like, be flexible, be knowledgeable. And if you can, find an affordable flight. Yeah, Keshler, to add on that, my flight that I booked for for May had the option to use it. I, I used points and use additional points to be able to get my points back in the event that I can't go. So now they're they're charging you to ensure that you actually get your refund, which I think they did before anyway. Travel insurance, you know, basic you economy. I right, you tack it on at the end <laughs> yeah. there, and you, you, yeah, you get it. But uh, that's, I would definitely recommend uh, doing that if you had the option. I've been in an argument with two different airlines, and I'm going to be on the phone with one of them after this uh, this, this chat. It's just like I'd like to have my money back because there are parts of the world that I will probably won't have access to for a while now. And it's like I, just, it'd be better for me just to have the money back than taking the voucher or points which they want to add a fee on top of and i'm telling them like hey uh why should i accept the fee if uh the the, the the take points or get my points back it seems a little bit much but i understand that what they're going through a lot of the airlines are in a situation whereas if you ask for money back then it could help possibly tank them so I'm trying to be flexible yeah yeah brandon yeah i mean it's the same it's i think if you're gonna wherever you're gonna go and travel do, do some background research, you know, learn what actually you can get. If you can get money back with hotels, try and go for the ones that are going to be refundable up to like a few days before. When you get to the country, especially in Europe where you're going, just, you know, social distance, wear a mask, wash your hands. And I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be good. Like I said, I think it's just going to get a year from now, the vaccine is out. I think little by little people's memory is going to get short. Um, but it is a really good point to make sure that you, if you're booking a hotel, get the full refund. With airlines, you know, like everybody else is saying right now, you can get, you should be able to get your money back, um, especially right now. And there are good discounts. I know on tours, on our tours, and I'm sure Igor as well, there's di you're discounting what you're offering right now. And that's going to stay until we get things back to I said, the normal flow as it was before. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, a good, guys... it's a good time to go. 
Now, are you guys expecting prices to increase once um, things do get back to normal to make up for lost revenue? Do you think places are going to do that? Rent car rental companies, Airbnb things like it, or should people anticipate paying more than they would have in 2020 for 2021 and 2022? I think it's just supply and demand. I think that's what yeah. it'll come down to. You know, if nobody's buying a, nobody's renting a car, the price is going to keep going down. Once they start renting the cars and they start running out of supply, right. then they're just going to raise the prices up. For tickets, for any of the museum, museum tickets will probably stay the same. But, you know, now you have a few uh, sites that are also offering discounted tickets in the, in, the, in the afternoon as opposed to the morning time. So I think people are going to get kind of creative. But in the end, I think it just comes down to supply. And demand. Right. I'm hoping that some of the airline changes stick around for a little while, like re either no change fees or severely reduced change fees, ideally less baggage fees, and, you know, actually being able to get a refund if you book a basic economy. Yeah. I, like I said, I think it's going to last until when they're trying to lure you in with the honey, you know, yeah. until until they're completely full. It's like, all right, back to before. Hey, or there's like a call. Four page disclaimer. These, you know, you can only get your refund if this, or if you're following these particular protocols. Right. Right. Yeah, you have to provide a doctor's note to get, uh, to change your flight <laughs> <laughs> these days. Yeah. So, which, right, yeah. which I did have happen to me last year. It's the first time I've ever had that happen. Got full refund for basic economy flight because I had a collapsed lung and couldn't fly. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's intense. Yeah. It was very frustrating. <laughs> All right, so that, that that wraps up the future of travel conversation. Thank you all for coming on today. So I, I briefly, before we get off, so Brandon Shaw, he is the co-founder, operator, owner, the tour guide. Check it out. Uh, good tour YouTube guy. page. Guy. Tour the, guy. the tour guide. I'm, the, the tour guy. I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> yes. And the Roman guy. Yeah. Um, great YouTube page. That's actually how I discovered your company by researching my time that I wanted to spend in Italy, just typing it into YouTube, came across your 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 uh, channel and have been following since. Igor, uh, the tour leader Venice, operating out of Venice and the Prosecco region of Italy. Uh, if you guys are going there, check out his his website, his Instagram. You're very active on Instagram. Um, and so and so you could book there. Keschler, you are with Lake Canard Tourism and now a member of the Traveler's Blueprint. You can get tours with, with Keshler through our website as well. So thank you all for coming on today. And uh, that's that's it. So tune in next month. Uh, thank you all for coming in. Thanks, guys. Ciao, guys. <laughs> Ciao, thank you.